This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's Monday, and that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. A few weeks back, I did an MTG Top 10 on cards that cost 4 mana of the same color, and today we're following that up with a look at cards that cost 3 mana of the same color. While 3 mana of one color isn't quite as intense of a requirement as quadruple mana is, it's still pretty intense, and as a result, a lot of cards with that type of cost tend to be pretty powerful. To be eligible for this list, a card had to have three mana of the same color as its casting cost and have no other colored mana symbols. This includes cards that just cost those three mana, like Underworld Dreams, but it also includes cards that have other generic mana in their casting cost, like Violent Eruption. I chose to exclude hybrid mana costs from this video, just like I did on the quadruple costed one, since their casting cost isn't always three mana of the same color. In all, there were 411 cards eligible for this list, and in this video we'll talk about the 10 that have left the biggest mark on competitive magic. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A first tier top 8 is worth 2 points, this includes big events like World Championships and Pro Tours, and a second tier top 8 is worth 1 point, and this includes events like Grand Prix and Magic Fests. At number 10, it is Garruk, Primal Hunter. This Planeswalker costs triple green, and he comes with the ability to raise his loyalty while making a 3-3 that can either protect him or pressure your opponent, and a minus 3 ability that can draw you a lot of cards. And sometimes, when he comes down, just using his minus 3 right away is worth it, because he can give you several cards immediately. He also has an ultimate that makes a worm army. He was heavily played in Standard for all of these attributes. While in Standard it was played in Primeval Titan decks, it also saw play in more traditional aggro decks like Green White and Green Red, and it was played the most in the format dominating Jun Control in mid-range decks. Since rotating out of Standard though, he's never seen play anywhere else, and it's been almost a decade since Garruk Primal Hunter has gotten its last point, so he may not be on this list much longer. At number 10, it is Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. It has the same number of points as Garruk Primal Hunter, but has more first tier top 8, so I gave it the higher slot. Like all War of the Spark Planeswalkers, Jace has rules text other than just his loyalty abilities. In this case, if you manage to empty your library and try to draw a card when Jace is in play, you win the game immediately. This pairs with his plus one ability, which lets you get rid of three cards at a time, and because it's a draw ability, it can even be the effect that allows you to win the game with the other ability. His ultimate is pretty nice too, since it draws you a ton of cards and also comes with the potential win condition effect. Jace, Wielder of Mysteries, has gained almost all of its points in Pioneer decks, seeking to win the game by getting rid of their whole library. This was the goal in one of the format's most dominant decks, Demir Inverter, a deck which sought to use Inverter of Truth to get rid of the library, and then could either use Jace or Thassa's Oracle to win the game. The Inverter eventually got banned, and this has caused Jace to slow down, but he's still being played in decks like Arclight Phoenix and Lotus Field. It's also found some limited success in Modern Ad Nauseum and Demir Inverter decks, as well as Legacy Thassa's Oracle decks. He doesn't have any points since 2021 though, and the Inverter banning might mean that it will have a hard time gaining more points in the future. At number 8 it is Entreat the Angels. This powerful sorcery generates a bunch of 4-4 angel tokens, and it comes with the Miracle mechanic, which allows you to cast it for an alternate cost if it's the first card you draw in a turn. Despite all this power, Entreat the Angels actually didn't see much play in block, standard, or modern, mustering only a combined four points in those formats. Legacy is where Entreat has really made its name, as that format has lots and lots of ways to manipulate your library to the point it really doesn't feel so miraculous anymore to draw one of these and cast it at a discount. In Legacy, it used to be played alongside Sensei's Divining Top and Blue-White Miracle decks. The top is pretty absurd at making miracles happen. However, in April of 2017, the top got banned. This was a huge blow for Miracles, but since that banning, Entreat the Angels hasn't entirely disappeared from the format, managing 12 points in the last couple of years. The top might be gone, but these decks still have access to things like Portent and Preordain to set up Miracles. Miracles may not quite be the powerhouse it once was, but Entreat the Angels isn't done yet, and it has a good chance at moving up this list. If you're interested in a deeper dive on Miracle Decks, it is one of many archetypes I've covered on my deck history series, so check that out. 
And number seven, it is Bolas's Citadel. This legendary artifact can generate some pretty insane value once you get it into play. It lets you pay life instead of mana to cast cards from the top of your library, and this can mean you rip through several cards in a single turn. It even lets you play lands, though keep in mind you are still restricted to one land drop a turn, so if you hit a second land, you're done chaining things together. In addition to all that, it can also let you do 10 to the opponent by sacrificing 10 non-land permanents. While that doesn't sound like it would be easy to accomplish, the Citadel itself can make it happen, since it gives you so many extra cards. It was played in a variety of standard decks ranging from Esper Control to Golgari Aggro, but its most infamous home was in Sacrifice decks. These decks had a low curve and also ran a bunch of payoffs for sacrificing stuff, like Mayhem Devil. You might think that the deck could run out of life if it went too crazy with Bolas's Citadel, but the deck also had various ways to gain life, like Bastion of Remembrance. Versions of the deck running the Citadel could have a normal aggro plan in the early game, and then the Citadel would enable them to win the game even if the opponent had stabilized. Sacrifice decks running Citadel also excelled in both Historic and Pioneer, and the Citadel has even been powerful enough for Vintage, where it can help Storm decks really get going by casting a bunch of free spells. It's very well positioned to keep on gaining points. At number 6, it is Teferi, Mage of Jalfir. This version of Teferi is from 2006 Time Spiral, and that was a long ways before he ever got a Planeswalker card, and in fact, it was the first time he got a card representing him at all. He had appeared in Ard and his name had been in card names, but he hadn't had a card that was just him. And you can see from the beginning that he liked to mess with people and when they could play spells. This version of Teferi has Flash himself, gives Flash to your creatures, and makes it so opposing spells can only be cast at sorcery speed. In Block and Extended, Teferi was played mostly in Control decks. In Standard, it was usually more of a sideboard card, and it came in as a way to interfere with Counter Magic and Fairies, many of which had Flash. In Modern, it's been played by Control decks, but also various combo decks which use Teferi to make it so the opponent can't interfere with the combo. It's been included in decks like Ad Nauseam, Birthing Pod, Splinter Twin, and Scape Shift. Teferi doesn't have any points since 2020, and its spot on the list could be in trouble going forward, especially with such active cards right behind it. At number 5, it is Goblin Chain Whirler. The Whirler is part of a rare cycle of creatures in Dominaria, and all the cards cost 3 mana of the same color and give you a ton for what you pay. The Whirler is the only card from that cycle to make this list, and it is certainly the best in the cycle. At worst, the Whirler is a 3 mana 3 3 with first strike that does 1 damage to the opponent. That's already a card worth looking at in a lot of aggro decks. However, he can usually cause even more problems than that, killing X1s and lowering the loyalty of an opposing planeswalker, or even picking one off. Because of its somewhat tricky mana cost, the Chain Whirler was almost exclusively played in mono red aggro decks in both Standard and Pioneer. It's also gained points in Goblin Tribal decks in Historic, Modern, and Legacy. Thanks to its multi-format success, Goblin Chain Whirler is relatively well positioned to gain more points going forward. At number 4, it is Necropotence, which might be one of the first cards you think of when you hear 3 mana of the same color. This super powerful enchantment pretty much lets you pay life to draw cards. Necropotence is a card that was famously underrated by people when it came out, as people just couldn't imagine the downside was worth it. I mean, lowering your life gets you closer to losing, right? People quickly realized they were wrong once they started playing with Necropotence, and they did in Standard, Extended, and Legacy. Turns out being able to draw a bunch of cards for no mana is pretty good. Most decks that ran Necropotence were built around it too, and they ran things like Drain Life, that could just help you keep gaining life and drawing more cards, and Zuron Orb would give you a similar effect. The card was so out of control by 2000 and 2001 that it was banned in Legacy and Extended, and restricted in Vintage. Necropotence has actually enjoyed a bit of a renaissance lately, as it's begun to be played in decks in Vintage that seek to win the game using Thassa's Oracle. Necropotence can help you find your combo pieces for the deck and decrease the size of your deck. Necropotence decks are actually another kind of deck I've covered in my deck history series, so if you're interested in learning more, check that video out. At number 3, it is Court of Calling. This triple green costed instant lets you tutor up a creature with a mana value of X or less and put it directly into play. Because this card has Convoke, you can often make X a pretty huge number. This type of card is great for toolbox decks, because you can search up whatever singleton creature it is you need in a given situation. Toolbox decks also usually run a creature-based combo that can win them the game immediately too, which Cord is a big help with, because it basically counts as additional copies of whatever combo piece you need. While it didn't do a whole lot in Standard, it did find success in Extended, in particular in an elf combo deck 
They used a bunch of cheap mana elves and Glimpse of Nature to rip through a bunch of the library, and then you would cast Court of Calling and search up a Predator Dragon, which would win you the game right away. In Modern, Glimpse of Nature was banned from the beginning to keep that deck from being a thing, but Court of Calling has been a fixture in Modern anyway, and it is far and away the format where it's been the most successful. In Modern, it's used as a way to more consistently assemble creature-based combos, like Malira Silvok Outcast, plus Murderous Redcap and a Sacrifice Outlet. It's also been played in Kiki-Jiki combo decks, and more recently, it's been used in Yawgmoth decks. If you get Yawgmoth and two creatures with Undying into play, you can sacrifice one of the Undying creatures to draw a card, and it will return with a plus and plus one counter. Then you can sacrifice your other Undying creature to draw another card, and then you put the minus one minus one counter from Yawgmoth on the first Undying creature. This removes a plus one plus one counter, so you can sacrifice it again, and it comes back, and you rinse and repeat from there. You can draw a bunch of cards with the combo and usually find a way to win, either with Garolf's Messenger constantly coming back or some other sacrifice payoff, like Blood Artist. Basically, in modern, Court of Calling is great for assembling powerful combos that seem somewhat convoluted. And it seems like no matter what modern looks like, there's always a creature-based combo around that Cord can help you assemble. At number two, it is Doomsday. This sorcery costs three black mana, and it lets you give up half of your life to exile your whole library apart from five cards, and you get to put those cards in whatever order you want. Obviously enough, Doomsday has been a combo enabler over the years, since it lets you make sure you're going to draw whatever combo pieces you need over the next few turns. It's gained all of its points in the Eternal formats. In Legacy, it's been used in decks like Ad Nauseum, and in Legacy and Vintage, it's been used in Storm. It's gotten a really big boost in both formats in the recent past as a result of the printing of Thassa's Oracle since that is a card that goes perfectly with Doomsday. Since you shrink your library and make sure you get the Oracle, which will win you the game with its Enter the Battlefield trigger because you cast Doomsday. Both Doomsday and Necropotence are played in that deck, so it's a deck that features two cards that made this list. And at number one, by a whole lot, it's Cryptic Command, which is probably the card that many of you expected to see at the top of this list. It was part of the very first cycle of commands appearing originally in Lorwyn. Like all commands, Cryptic gives you four options, and you can choose two of them. This has good flexibility, and it gives you a ton of value for your mana. It isn't hard to set up a two-for-one with it, as just choosing the counter and draw a card option will guarantee you one of those. The counter draw a card option is the most common, but the other options have their place too. The ability to bounce a creature can come in handy in a pinch, as can the ability to tap down all of your opponent's creatures. So, yeah, this offers a lot of power and flexibility. The one downside about the command is the triple blue and the mana cost, so it doesn't find its way into all the control decks in Modern, but any control deck that can play it in Modern does, and that's a big part of what makes its score so huge. It has seen play in other formats too, like Block, Standard, and Extended. Cryptic Command is still actively putting up points, and it has such a massive lead that it is unlikely it will ever slip down this list. So, those are the 10 cards that cost 3 mana of the same color that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. If you want to own any of these cards, check out the description where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each of them. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past videos, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. And lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, you can on Patreon. Thanks for watching.